Welcome to the latest episode of Star Cells and God. This is the podcast where we discuss new discoveries taking place at the frontiers of science that have implications for the Christian faith, where we look at how these discoveries provide evidence for God's existence, God's nature, and the reliability of Scripture. My name is Fuzz Rana. I am a biochemist and a Christian apologist, and I'm joined in studio today by Dr. Jeff Zwerink, who is an astrophysicist and a Christian apologist, and we both work for an organization called Reasons to Believe. Reasons to Believe is the organization that sponsors this podcast, and this podcast is made possible by those people who support RTB. If you want to know more about RTB, go to our website, reasons.org, or you can follow us on social media, RTB underscore official. And then, of course, last but not least, make sure you go to our YouTube channel, Reasons to Believe, and subscribe, and use the notification button so that you can be alerted when the next episode of Star Cells and God drops. Okay, Jeff, well, uh, today we're both going to be talking about updates. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to be giving an update on CRISPR, the, the gene editing technology, right. and you're going to be giving us an update on artificial intelligence. So why don't you go ahead and open up for us? Uh, so what do you want to, to, to update us on? Right. Well, I, I mean, I've just been interested in artificial intelligence, and uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that thing there, there's just this increasing advance of artificial intelligence where, okay, it can do this and it can do this. Things that we thought may not be possible for the longest time. I mean, you know, people started playing games with artificial intelligence, but, you know, back in 60s, mm -hmm. that long ago. And I remember, you know, I did a podcast not too long ago. We talked about uh, where it finally built a computer that could beat the best human chess players. I think it was back in 1996 or seven. And in that time, there's just been this tremendous advances, <clears throat> excuse me, of what these AI programs can do. And they've gotten more efficient. They've gotten better. Whereas even the Deep Blue, when it beat uh, Gary Kasparov, it's this c dedicated piece of hardware, high-end computation at the or high-end computer s hardware at the time with these sophisticated algorithms that were trained on human, you know, trained with humans, very specific and highly, a lot of uh, expertise that goes into it. Whereas not too long after that, you know, within the last five to 10 years, there have been programs that have been developed that just uh, are basically, hey, here's how you play the game. <clears throat> the games go and play themselves and they learn how to or learn. I'll use that term loosely, where the, the programs play themselves, develop the expertise, and then eventually they get to where they can outplay the best humans. In fact, it's it's referred to superhuman uh, level of play <laughs> because you take the best human. Uh, humans are just going to lose every time. They're that good at it. And what was fascinating was a number of years ago, or well, about, probably about five years ago, or within the last five years, I'll say, there was one called Alpha, Alpha Zero, I think was the name. I forget it was Alpha Zero or Alpha Go, but where not only could it play chess, but this same program could play chess and shogi and go, which are three very different games. Mm. But this one program was capable of playing all three. Now, to my knowledge, it learned how to play chess, and then it learned how to play go, and it learned how to play shogi. So it wasn't like it was necessarily having, you know, learning how to play chess and using that knowledge to play the other. But nonetheless, it was pretty remarkable. So, that you so the software that's undergirding this is much more versatile than, than, let's say, the earlier versions of AI that were playing chess. Exactly, yes. And, and it's, you know, I said, it's, there's a different set of rules for playing chess, Go and Shogi. And so it, it's, it's just making it more generalized. Mm -hmm. But what's true is that all of those games are what are called perfect information games, which means you and I play chess or Go or Shogi or, or we all see all the information out there. There's no information you have that I don't or vice versa. So they're perfect information games. There's another group of AIs or another group of you know AI programs that are have been built to play imperfect information like poker, uh, you know Scotland Yard. There, yes, yeah, Stratego, places where you know when you play the game, you've got information I don't, and I've got information you don't, and we're trying to, I'm trying to learn what information you have while not revealing the information I have. 
And so how you play those games are just very different, but also how the AIs <clears throat> approach those games were different. So the, the AIs that play the perfect information are kind of search and learn, where it's like search deep into these trees, learn what it is and go with it. Whereas with uh, the, the imperfect information games, you have to take a, a game theoretic approach. You know, there's philosophies of how lines of reasoning, how do you, how do you use this information to infer what might be there, even though it's, you may be doing things, I've got to make a determination, but there's never, do I actually know what's going on there? There's always a, a much larger degree of uncertainty that doesn't exist in these uh, perfect, uh, perfect information scenarios. Well, there was a, a, a team of researchers that actually said, you know, can you integrate that into a single, again, you know, like with Chess Shogi and Go, can we build an AI that does all of this in one? And so they said, all right, let's build an AI that has the search and learning and self-play and also this uh, game theoretic reasoning part of it. And so it's taking, it's minimizing the amount of game specific knowledge that, or domain specific knowledge that needs to be there. But it's also making the play far more versatile. And there's a whole lot of deal, details to that that are interesting and fascinating, but uh, don't mm -hmm. uh, aren't really relevant to the discussion. But what I find fascinating about this is that there's this more general nature to what's going on. You know, one of my arguments or what I would say is, you know, okay, yes, it can, you know, Alpha, Alpha Go could play or Alpha Zero could play Shogi and uh, chess and Go. But it's not doing it the way we do. You know, like I said, mm -hmm. if I play Go, there's philosophies, strategies I learned that when I go in and I start playing another game, there's a different set of rules, but I'm still using that. I'm transferring that knowledge mm -hmm. from over here to over here. This is impressive. I'm not entirely sure whether it's building a knowledge tree that incorporates all of that and allows it to do it. But what it's doing is saying with one algorithm, if you will, this one algorithm can now deal with all these different situations. And that's impressive because that's what humans do that all the time. There's not like when I go out driving, I'm saying, okay, I'm in my driving algorithm, my driving algorithm, my getting dressed in the morning algorithm. You know, effectively, those are all the same thing. I can just handle a whole bunch of different environments with it. And so I just thought it was kind of impressive mm -hmm. that they were able to do that – especially since those two types of games are – the approaches to them were very different. They were meld the, meld, meld the approaches and integrate them into one mm -hmm. uh, program that actually achieves superhuman play in all of them. Uh, you know, and it's, especially it's like Scotland Yard, the one of the games they were playing. So it was chess and go, which are two of the most complicated perfect information games. And then uh, it was uh, poker and uh, Scotland Yard which are both imperfect information games, whereas poker has a more immediate payoff reward. You know, there's not, a, you don't have to, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of long-term planning. It's like this hand, mm -hmm. once you've won that hand, that's done. Whereas Scotland Yard, this is a, a game where, you know, you're moving around all the bus stations and train stops and taxi stops in London, and you've got a group of three to five, or one, two to five people that are trying to close in around one guy who's playing a spy. So it's immediate information, but there's a long-term strategy to it as well. And so it was able to do all of that. And I, I just thought that was pretty impressive. Yeah. I don't know. How, I mean, what do you, when you hear, what is your response to, to hearing stuff like that? Well, you know, it, it seems to me that, um, that we are inching our way towards what you might call a general AI. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, there's our, I'm reading, I'm, I'm not that well versed in, in the, the nuts and bolts of what's happening with AI technology, but I'm even beginning to hear people comment on the fact that this generative AI is again, nudging us towards uh, some type of general, mm -hmm. general AI. So it seems like, you know, what, you know, everybody seemed to think may not be possible may at least some version of that may actually materialize or emerge. Right. Well, and, and to me, there's this, this, what I find interesting in that pursuit 
is that these things that we thought, oh, that's a hallmark of human intelligence, we're now developing AIs that can do that. And, and they parallel, there, there's a similarity to the process they do, but it's universally agreed. These things don't have minds behind them. And so the way I play Go or, or chess would be very different than the way this AI does. But nonetheless, it's doing what mm -hmm. I do just better than what I do. And in fact, it so well mimics my ability to do it that if I didn't know better, I would assume I'm playing mm -hmm. a very advanced human, or, you know, just a human right. that plays it very well. And so I, I, I kind of agree with you. There are these... I think we'll probably end up at some sort of artificial general intelligence. That doesn't mean we've created sentience or consciousness. We've just right. created something that can do virtually er very general stuff just differently than we do. Yeah. And, and I think that's an important distinction to keep in mind. Well, you know, and, and this leads to, I think, a point that both of us have made in different at different times and in different contexts, mine more with the idea of animal intelligence. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is where anthropomorphization becomes really concerning. That yeah, as human point, beings, yeah. you know, we have this, what's called theory of mind, where we recognize that other people have minds like ours. And, mm -hmm. and so we have an intuitive understanding of how they're thinking, what they're thinking, what their emotions are like. Right. And, and but we can't turn that off. And so we transfer that theory of mind capability to inanimate objects, right, or to our, the pets that mm -hmm. we have, where we, we see behaviors that seem to be on the surface reminiscent of something that a human would do, and we, we use our theory of mind to impose, mm -hmm. you know, human motives, human qualities to, to creatures or to systems right. that don't have it. And so when you start getting these things that have this general intelligence, mm -hmm. even though it's not like us, even though it's just mimicking us, or maybe not even mimicking us, but doing something where the output is right. similar to our capacity, right. there's going to be this real tendency to think of it, those things as like us. Right. And I don't, I really don't think it's such a big deal, you know, like with chat GPT, you know, it, I hesitate. I don't, I don't ever use the word conversation, but when you interact with ChatGPT, you know there, there's a, a, a as long as you appreciate that, hey, what it's doing, you're, you're not interacting with a being or a person or a consciousness right. there. It's a great utility. It does lots of good things, and so. But I do think we do need to be conscious and aware of that, and and that's where a, a, the another discovery that or related AI update is. Um, you know, all of these AIs, what they're doing is they're developing some sort of way of associating input with output. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, you could characterize humans as doing that. I'm looking, I've got visual, auditory, sensory input. I'm doing something and I'm generating output. Mm -hmm. I, I think what I do with my mind is different than just an algorithm, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. associating input with output. Well, what uh, another team of researchers has done is looked at different AIs and said, how susceptible are they to attacks? Mm. And the, this is, you know, we deal with this all the time. If you do, you know, work on the internet at all, when the internet was originally developed, the whole idea was, hey, is there a way we can connect things, transfer information? It was designed to do something. And to facilitate interaction and communication. And it did that very well. Problem is that same set of tools that can use to be communicate good information can also be used to generate can to be, can be used to communicate <laughs> bad or malicious information. And so you have to worry about phishing and people hacking your computer and you know the computer security industry is a multi-billion dollar, if not larger industry, because as the more sophisticated our computers get, the more we need to be able to block the attacks that come. And so there was a group of science or computer scientists who were looking at how vulnerable <coughs> are these AIs, and specifically what they mm -hmm. were looking at were image processing AIs. And there's a couple of different techniques that AIs or algorithms to do that. And so they looked at two different algorithms. But the idea being here is like, okay, so 
an AI, the general approach is there's the, the, the image, the AI breaks down the image, constructs what it is, you know, and it says, is this cat or dog? And, you know, that, those sorts of things. Or is this a stop sign or a tumor, you know, depending on the application. But what they're doing is saying, all right, given the way these AIs work, how vulnerable are they to malicious attacks? And what mm -hmm. we mean by malicious attacks is that when an AI sees images with stop signs, it's trained to, in various environments, say, okay, here's a stop sign. But if you analyze, if you feed information in, you can analyze and get a, you can figure out what it's doing to determine whether it's a stop sign. And once you've determined that, now you can say, can I manipulate mm. a sign so that instead of saying it's a stop sign, it says it's a green light go or something else like that. And what they found, uh, again, without getting into all the details, except to say, you know, what they were looking at is attacks that would preserve that in most instances, it does very well at giving stop signs. So it doesn't interfere with the normal functioning. But, it, you know, like in a uh, AI that is saying, I want to adjust lights so that public transit vehicles and uh, commercial vehicles have longer green lights so that they get better. Can you manipulate things so that my car is recognized mm -hmm not only as a public transport or commercial vehicle, but recognized or the output that it gives, it keeps the ordering of things in there so that there aren't flags that say, oh, there's a malicious attack going on. And it turns mm -hmm. out that all of these different, very commonly used AIs are very susceptible to these sorts of attacks. And these attacks are not high computationally intensive things to do. So it's not like you need this supercomputer to be able to generate an, uh, something on your car that says, okay, you're a commercial vehicle. It's something that with relatively low computational power you could do, which means they're very vulnerable to attacks. Mm. And so I just, it's, it's, I see this parallel between we're making things that are more and more sophisticated, can do incredible things, but at the same time, we seem to be the vulnerability of these things to being manipulated kind of seems to run parallel with that. Mm. And we're going to have to invest a lot of resources because you can't have X-ray diagnosis machines or AIs that can be manipulated like this because the one thing that a human will bring into that is an awareness of what might be going on. I mean, you know, we've got subliminal messaging that goes on, you know, and that, that was outlawed in there partially because that's something that can happen that people aren't aware of. But if you know subliminal messaging is out there, you could actually, you could do things to take account of yourself to figure out whether you're being influenced or not. You can't... The AIs don't ever come along and say, wait a second, this just doesn't make sense, or, oh, there's something off here. Yeah. So it's it's there, 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 there is this distinction between what an AI is doing as much as it's accomplishing and all the fascinating things yeah. it is. There are these things that we've got to be careful of. And, and to me, the, the apologetic takeaway of this is that it's not a the, the issue is not AI itself. It's what sort of people are we becoming? Mm -hmm. Are we becoming people who recognize, do we just use the AI because, oh, it's fascinating, it's cool, or do we recognize, hey, there's a downside to this and I need to be aware of the downside so that I utilize the good side but minimize the downside and yeah. so that other people can't use the downside. There, there's who we are as humans become very important in this AI game. Yeah, well, you know, and this is where I think um, the, the Christian worldview has a lot to contribute to these mm -hmm. conversations, not only because... I think there's a very high ethical standard that is associated with the Christian worldview, but there's also this recognition of sin, right? Right. That we realize that human beings are sinful, that we're capable of doing incredibly good things, mm -hmm. but we also are capable of doing unbelievably wicked things and everything kind of in between. Right. And, you know, and and I think a lot of people that think about this tend to be naive in terms of human nature, or at least there's a there's a very... Uh, if you don't have a, a healthy view of human sin nature, mm -hmm. there's a, a tendency to think that people are intrinsically good unless otherwise, you know, 
influenced yeah. versus people are intrinsically r- capable of horrific evil and will occasionally yeah. do good. Right? Well, well, and the solution to it is very different than how you think about it because I, I've just kind of watched how we've approached things, you know, even going back to the war on drugs, smoking, whatever it was, that it's largely if we get people the right information, they're going to choose well, which is the – you know, kind of inherently good. It's a lack of information problem. But, you know, I think we've done a, enough of these experiments. It's not information. I mean, even just personally, that's like there's stuff I do that I know is stupid and idiotic, but there's something else going on there. It's not right. just I need more information to know how to how to do what's right. Yeah. It's a sin problem, which is mm-hmm. not – it's not more information. It's even not even more laws it's something else. It's character right. transformation that needs to happen. Yeah, and, and and then also I think the Christian faith also recognizes that as human beings we lack wisdom. So even yeah. when we're not doing something malicious, <laughs> we we might be doing something incredibly stupid, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and and that there's or, just or even well intentioned, just naive. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, and and I think you see this played out, for example. When you look at the the damage and the destruction caused by hurricanes, as an as a case in yeah. point, you know, the you know what happened with Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans is absolutely tragic. But on the other hand, you build this very large city mm-hmm. on the coast below sea level. What do you think is is well, going to where happen? Where you know hurricanes hit? Yes, if if you. If you look at it on a long enough scale, so yeah, yeah. So, so what do you think is going to happen, right? right? Yeah. And yes, indeed, we do have the technology, you know, to to prevent flooding, and pr- to prevent the, the the harmful effects of hurricanes. But then you're trusting that that techno- in that technology, you're also trusting that people have actually, you know, implemented right, right, in, implemented it in the way that they were supposed to, yeah, and that they've maintained it, mm-hmm. right, and. And so, you know, that just, again, illustrates really the, the collective lack of wisdom we can have, which is very frightening when you start thinking about technologies that are incredibly powerful mm-hmm. that are probably increasingly poorly understood, even by right. the, yes. the experts that are implementing them. What's, what's it actually doing right. is, is, a, is a giant question mark. I, my, <laughs> my son-in-law, has a, his, his brother works with AI, right. and we've had some fascinating conversations. <laughs> and, you know, he will readily admit there are things that are going on that we don't completely understand right. that w- in terms of how this AI is performing. It's performing in unexpected ways. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there, there's an interesting part of that is, is the best I can tell. I mean, okay, when you're playing chess or go, I mean, there's an, there are clearly objective rules, bounds of what's going on there. But a lot of these, you know, chat GPT where it's, it's ultimately being trained on a whole bunch of human produced data. One of the things that I think would be really interesting to do is to just let the AIs Go unfiltered, if you will, just train it on the data and then see what comes out because what that's going to reveal is the biases, the inequities, the prejudices, the stupidity. It will see all the correlations that we could argue aren't there. I mean, I would I would be terrified to do this at some level, but it just have it analyze like three or four days of my life and say, hey, what do you see? There's a... There's no – it's going to be – I don't want to use the term objective. It's going to reflect what's actually true, mm-hmm. not my idealized view or what I wanted to view. It could be a great tool for that if we're willing to use it to help us learn to correct our behavior as opposed mm-hmm. to trusting it to define our behavior or yeah. define what we're going to do. So, Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's a brave new world as they, <laughs> as they say often. <laughs> It is. So So that's that's what I, you know, it's like I am repeatedly impressed uh, of what we're able to accomplish with AI. Things that are, I mean, when you think about playing poker and playing these games, these are, these are not trivial things to do. There's even trying to analyze in your mind, what are you doing and how are you making the decisions? There are things that we just intuitively, or 
or we've done them so much, the 12,000 steps are hidden from us because we're only aware of this. And to be able to get games that, or AIs that do this, it's, mm. it is really cool. And there's some serious peril if we're not pretty wise about how we use them at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's actually a theme that I'm going to bring up uh, <laughs> in, in what I'm going to talk about too. So, well, go ahead. That's, uh, I'm finished up there. So. Okay. Well, in in uh, just to ease us into the into the transition, I'm going to see if I can test your pop culture acumen. Do you know who that is? I do not. I would. Uh... I would guess Louis Armstrong, but I guess I'm wrong. Well, he's he was a jazz player. Like <laughs> this is Miles Davis. Miles Davis, okay. Yeah, and you know, and, and Miles Davis was uh, died at 65. I'm not sure. It's been a, a number of years ago that he died, but for nearly 40 years, he was literally at the at the cutting edge of innovation in jazz music. Hmm, okay, and you know, considered one of the greatest jazz you know, performers of all time and, and innovators of all time. He also was really well known or what was really well known about him also was the fact that he was always quite ill. He had very poor health. Huh. And it turns out that later on in life, they discovered that he had sickle cell anemia, which explains a number of the health issues that he had uh, throughout his life. He didn't realize okay. that he had sickle cell anemia. And, you know, this is a a really devastating disease that doesn't impact a large number of people, mm -hmm. maybe four to five million people around the world, but it does impact communities because it's typically people of sub-Saharan descent. So oh, while it's maybe not that pervasive of a disease uh, across the board, it is highly a highly pervasive mm -hmm. condition within the African-American community okay. here in the United States. And it's a very... Uh, very painful disease. Uh, people will actually have what are called pain crises oh, really? when they have sickle cell anemia, mm -hmm. where it's just debilitating pain that takes place. Hmm. They they suffer from vision issues. Okay. Uh, they are prone to infections. They they will have uh, feet and ha their hands uh, swell, so they have trouble well, with their extremities. Isn't sickle cell? It's a I know there's something where it's like a. I thought it was blood cells, but maybe I'm wrong. Yes. What's like so? They're just the blood cells are kind of deformed. Yes, which means they're not doing all of the function they're supposed to yeah, normally do. Correct? That's a, that's a great point that leads us into the, a, a segue. Uh, th this is a, a slide showing. Just pay attention to the right hand side. Uh, essentially, uh, three different disease states that are uh, or three different conditions. One mm -hmm. is the the top is the healthy red blood cells. They're right. donut shaped. Uh, they are uh, pliable. They, they'll they undergo deformation as they move through the bloodstream, particularly mm -hmm. through capillaries. So they can squeeze through capillaries. They're highly durable. And the, the lifetime of a red blood cell is about 120 days. Huh. So there's, the red blood cells are constantly being made by uh, cells in the bone marrow, hemipoietic stem cells. And, um, and so they, the turnover is about 120 days. Sickle cell anemia is a condition, as you pointed out, where the red blood cells are deformed. They're sickle-shaped. Mm -hmm. But they, they also are uh, – the, the, the cell membranes are fragile as well, so they, they tend to break apart. So the life – Are, are they fragile because they're thin, fragile because they're brittle? I'm or, not quite sure, not sure what, what okay. creates the, the fragility, All but right. the, they, they're prone to lysing. And, and that means that the, the lifespan of a, of a sickle cell blood sh cell is uh, much less than 120 days. Mm -hmm. I don't know off the top of my head what it is, maybe 30 or 40 days on average. So you end up with anemia as mm -hmm. a, a patient suffering from sickle cell right. uh, anemia. Uh, but again, because of the unusual shape of the red blood cells, it'll they wind up clogging or getting caught right. up in okay. arteries, which means... That, that which explains the the symptoms that mm -hmm. people have, you, you know, you lose vision or you have vision problems because the red blood cells are clogging up in the mm -hmm. in the capillaries that are connected with the retina, uh, or uh, you you have you know uh, arteries clogged that are going to the spleen, which mm -hmm. is playing a role in helping the body uh, ward off infections, right, and things like that. So. The, the, that sickling sh and that sickling shape also, again, makes the red blood cells fragile. 
And it, this is all due to a single mutation uh, in what's called the beta globin gene, mm -hmm. uh, which is codes for the beta globin subunit of hemoglobin. So this is a cartoon showing hemoglobin, and it consists of four protein chains that each chain is called a subunit that interact to form this tetramer or this four subunit complex. Okay. Two of the chains are called in, in adult hemoglobin are called the beta chains. Two are called the alpha chains. And it turns out that there's also this group called a heme that has an iron bound to it mm -hmm. uh, or a porphyrin ring system with an iron bound to it. It's called a heme system. And this is where oxygen binds. Right. And it's actually because of the four subunits, there's a cooperative binding of oxygen, meaning when oxygen binds to one subunit, it becomes easier to bind to the next one, oh, easier to bind to the next one, which creates this oxygen binding profile that is ideal mm -hmm. uh, so that under very high oxygen conditions, hemoglobin is going to bind very high levels of oxygen. And then as you get to low oxygen conditions, which is what happens when you move away from the lungs to mm -hmm. the body's extremities, it's going to release the oxygen very readily. Gotcha. And so it's uh, this highly optimal oxygen so, so binding. So rather than just it can bind and hold on to it, it can bind and release yes. pretty well or, right. or very well. That's, and so this is all cool. due to the, the interaction of the, of the subunits. Right. Well, in sickle cell anemia, there is a single mutation in one of the amino acids of the beta subunit. Mm -hmm. And this is a, typically a glutamate, which is an, a negatively charged amino acid. Uh, and it's replaced with an amino acid called valine, which is hydrophobic. It's, it's water insoluble. Okay. And what that means is that under low oxygen conditions, because of the, the surface is sticky now of hemoglobin, mm -hmm. it actually forms these clusters okay. or these hemoglobin oligomers or polymers. And that causes the sickling of the red blood cell. That so, so, so in some sense, you could look at that as normal hemoglobin is just going to kind of float around inside the cell, give it that amorphous, squeezable, but right. now that it's clumping together, you just don't have the flexibility right? and you're not going to end up in that round shape. That, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's the way to think about okay. it. So, so then that that's sickle cell anemia. There, there's another disease that's a blood disease that's related to sickle cell anemia called uh, well, the, the diseases are called beta thalassemias. And here you have, again, a defect in the beta subunit. Mm -hmm. and in some instances, there can be mutations to the beta subunit that don't cause the red blood cells to sickle, but compromise the oxygen binding capacity of hemoglobin. And then there are other mutations that cause the beta globin subunits to be produced at low levels or maybe not produced at all. And, so and that, presumably, these are all different mutations. So yeah. what, what causes sickle cell anemia and what causes these others? Right. They're all different mutations. But they all are ultimately involving the beta globin subunit, okay. right? Uh, and so in beta thalassemia, you're going to have normally shaped red blood cells. You're just not going to have very many of them. Okay. Or, very, or you're, the ones you do have are going to have a, a compromised oxygen-carrying mm -hmm. capacity. So this is a, these are, you know, again, very serious diseases that, that are very painful where there's no real cure for these diseases. You can manage the diseases. Yeah, okay. um, in, in, in both cases, you could potentially cure the patient, but it would involve essentially a bone marrow transplant where you'd have to find a donor mm -hmm. that has, that's compatible. And then the patient is going to have to probably take, you know, uh, anti-rejection medication for out most of their life. It's my guess is it's a relatively <clears throat> painful procedure. It is, or it's invasive if not painful. It's a painful yeah. procedure, and it's not widely available. Right, right, because of the need for a a donor match. Well, in December of 2023, just a couple of months ago, the FDA actually approved two gene therapy uh, protocols that mm -hmm. will actually cure patients, or at least we believe. They will cure patients hmm. of sickle cell anemia. And this, these procedures are also approved in the UK in, in November of 2023. Okay. And so uh, in the UK, in the US at least, there is now uh, gene therapy treatments that are available that could, again, potentially cure sickle cell anemia. This is a huge milestone, mm -hmm. not only in, in treating 
you know, sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemias, but it's also a huge milestone because I think this is the first FDA approved therapy for for gene therapies or oh, really? FDA okay. approved, you know, procedures for gene therapies, one of them involving... So the fact that it's approved means there's been a fair bit of research that it's actually got some level of effectiveness and right. will have... A, uh, right. Well, not only should have effectiveness in humans, but presumably had human trials that show some yes. sort of... Yes. That is actually remarkable. Yeah, yeah. And so, well, for example, uh, the, the, the two therapies, they're not identical. Mm -hmm. One of them is by a, a company called Vertex Pharmaceuticals, that and there are therapies called Casgevy, I think is the name, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. But it's involving CRISPR gene editing. Okay. And I'll explain how that one works. And then the other one is called is by Bluebird Pharmaceutical. No, sorry, Bluebird Bio. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a therapy called Life Genia. And in the um, the Vertex clinical trials, I think they had about 45 patients. And 30 were cured of wow. sickle cell anemia. That was a that was a high enough level of success that they progressed it gotcha. or approved it for clinical use. I'm sure there's going to con be continued studies. Yeah, but it's now available as a therapy or as a treatment. Well, it'd be real interesting to know why. Yeah, you know, 66 percent's not bad, but why? Well, why I, does the third I, not work? So yeah, and I can explain why that <laughs> is. Fair point, in, but yeah, in, okay. in a minute here, <laughs> and and then with the, the life genie, I think it was a smaller clinical trial, but again, they saw a high level of, mm -hmm. of, of cure. Although one downside is one of the patients ended up developing uh, leukemia, which mm -hmm. is a blood cancer, right. okay. and I can explain why that probably happened. Uh, but again, it was successful enough that. That, that the FDA approved it mm -hmm. as a clinically available procedure now. And the idea behind this is, is that red blood cells are produced by these cells called hemipoietic stem cells that are found in the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you isolate hemipoietic stem cells from the patient. You use gene therapy to genetically modify the genome of the hemipoietic stem cells to either correct or compensate for uh, the uh, sickle cell anemia or the beta thalassemia, and then you reinfuse those hemipoietic stem cells back into the bone marrow, and now the patient is going to produce red blood cells that will compensate for the, for the sickle uh -huh. cell anemia. So this is a, a, a diagram showing essentially on the left-hand side how that procedure uh -huh. works. It's called a, an ex vivo gene therapy where you're doing the gene manipulation external Outside, to the patient yeah. in the lab and then reinfusing the cells versus an in vivo treatment where you're trying to target the gene editing package mm -hmm. to the particular tissue of interest, which is very hard to do right now. It's, there's not good ways to do this. But the idea behind the Casgevy Cas treatment is this, that... Um, they the and the procedure is actually a pretty intensive procedure that's painful, but they first of all will administer drugs to the patient that cause the hemipoietic stem cells to leach out of the bone into the bloodstream. Okay, and and so they'll do a series of transfusion drug treatments followed by transfusions where they isolate the hemipoietic uh -huh. stem cells and they purify them and then in the lab they do a classic CRISPR gene editing protocol mm -hmm. where they actually disable uh, a gene called the BCL11A gene. And I'll explain what, what that is in a minute. But then once they've done that, they have to evaluate the stem cells to make sure that the gene editing actually occurred in the mm -hmm. way it was intended. Right. So there's any, there are efficiency issues and there are what are called off-target effects, mm -hmm. which explains probably why a third of the patients yeah, no, <laughs> didn't you know, have successful treatments. Then they will destroy the bone marrow in the patient mm -hmm. through radiation, and then they implant the hemipoietic stem cells, and it takes about a month before they, they start, the, the bone uh, marrow starts to generate Okay. Red blood cells. It, it, and so they've got to be, you know, they also don't have an immune system or their mm -hmm. immune system is compromised. So this is a, a painful, uh, protracted procedure. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, the outcome is that you wind up having a patient that is potentially cured 
of sickle cell anemia. Right. So that painful, you know, there were some interviews I read with some of the patients who described this, uh, how painful it was, but it's like it was worth the few mm-hmm. months of pain because now I basically don't suffer the symptoms right. of, of sickle cell anemia. Now, the idea behind the cas gevi treatment is pretty cool. What they, The BCL11 gene codes for what's called a transcription factor, which actually turns off the production of what are called the delta subunits for hemoglobin. So hemoglobin has an adult form and a fetal form. Mm-hmm. It's A and F, the A and okay. F forms. The, the A form has two alpha subunits, two beta subunits. The fetal form has two alpha subunits and two delta subunits. Mm-hmm. And the delta subunits create an oxygen binding profile for hemoglobin that is optimized for the fetus okay. that's in, you know, in the womb. Right. And then after about six weeks after birth, the BCL11 gene is turned on, shutting down the production of the delta subunits, and ma- meaning the only subunits that you're going to get now are beta subunits mm-hmm. that will give you an ox- the, the adult version of hemoglobin. So it's a really slick system. I was just that you're describing that. I'm like, that is just slick considering <laughs> right. what humans do. I mean, right. it <laughs> looks very well designed to me. So. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, but what's interesting is that by disabling the, the BCL, oh, the BCL11A gene, um, which in the CRISPR gene editing is really very good at, at destroying genes. It's okay. not the, the version that's called the classic version isn't great at replacing defective regions with okay. healthy regions. There's other CRISPR technology that's being developed that's working towards that end. But it can destroy stuff pretty well. Yeah, and so, okay. and the idea is that if you destroy that gene that's inhibiting the delta subunit production, that that subunit will now start being produced, which means that you're going to have a mixture of hemoglobin both the adult and fetal, adult and fetal, but that the, the but the fetal form will start to dilute out the sickle cell form, mm-hmm. which means that you're less likely to get clumping uh, of the so, hemoglobin, <clears throat> it, which means you're you're not going to get the sickling shape. So so, so it's not. A, <clears throat> It's not really it's it's solving the problem, but it's not rectifying right. it. It's it's right. a it's a suboptimal solution, but it's given the t- given the way the right. body works. Is, so you're not making it work as a normal human would, but using this infant right. variant, you can make it work well enough that it doesn't cause the problems that you're used right, to. Right, right. Okay. So so it is a cure in that you know, you, you do a single treatment and mm-hmm. you're compens- you're creating a system that's compensating right. for the, those effects. So it's a, it's a cure, uh, presumably, right, yeah. right? We don't know what the long-term effects are or if this is permanent, but presumably it is. Mm-hmm. So it is a cure, but it's not correcting the right, issue, yeah. fundamentally correcting the issue. But in principle, you could do that if that you could develop a CRISPR gene editing package that could actually go in like there, there are these things called CRISPR base editors mm-hmm. that can replace one nucleotide with mm-hmm. another, highly targeted. So you could, in a sense, reverse the mutation in the hemipoietic stem cells to create a healthy version to replace the, the valine with a glutamate or valine with maybe another amino acid that isn't going to cause the sickling problem. So presumably, so they they actually know what it would take to reverse this, right? But just the technology to do that actual process is not well developed at this right. point, right? Okay. But but it's it's not out of the question. <clears throat> gotcha. So in other words, you could see a second version of Casagevi that actually could could correct the, de- right, the yeah. genetic defect, right? Now the the other the Life Genia approach is not a CRISPR approach, but mm-hmm. it is a gene therapy. And this is actually using a virus, uh, a retrovirus, to deliver a beta hemoglobin to the to the red blood cells mm-hmm. that um, uh, compensates again for the the, the the sickle cell hemoglobin okay. effects. So um, this is a what's called a lentivirus. So it's a retrovirus that will normally, when it infects a cell, will incorporate its genetic material into the host genome. So what they've done is they take a lentivirus and you modify it so that it it can't be infectious, mm-hmm. but it still will incorporate 
itself into the host genome. Okay. And then what you do is you add uh, a gene for beta globin to it. Mm -hmm. In this case, they're adding a genetically engineered version of beta globin that disrupts the oligomerization of hemoglobin and sickle cell anemia. So is this inserting, effectively inserting new DNA into the right. DNA? Right. And it's new DNA that will produce some level of useful red blood cells. Right. Yes. Okay. All right. Or or will start producing beta globin or version of beta globin that has been designed in such a way that it will inhibit Mm -hmm. uh, the, the sickling effect. Okay. Right. So it's, it's compens it's still a compensation. And, and so in this case, this gets incorporated into the genome of the hemipoietic stem cells. So they're going to be producing mm -hmm. now red blood cells with a mixture of beta globins at a genetically engineered version right. okay. and, and the sickle version, sickle cell version. Uh, but this is why probably one of the patients developed leukemia is because when you are incorporating viruses yeah, no. <laughs> into the genome, it may not go where you, you want it to go. So the bottom line is that, you know, this is really, again, uh, these are huge milestones mm -hmm. in medicine, huge mm -hmm. milestones in, in gene therapy, general, and generally speaking. And, you know, um, the, the, in general, the technical concerns with gene therapy is how do you target the right cells? Right. right, and you got to get the right cells and fix them without damaging right the right stuff. Right, and so, you know, the fact that we saw this success with again the beta thalassemias and sickle cell anemia opens up the path for other blood diseases mm -hmm. to be treated. You know, with you know this kind of an approach. Right. So, it could be that that we do actually have soon gene therapies that will cure people with blood genetic blood diseases uh, as a matter of routine. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting. You still have to figure out how do you deliver the gene editing package, mm -hmm. you know, to sp specific cells. And believe it or not, some of the work that was done developing the COVID vaccines is going to be, be critical in terms of facilitating that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and of course, efficiency is an issue when you're, you know, when you're working in the lab, it's very easy to ensure the gene editing package is getting into most of the cells. Right. It's very hard when you're doing it, you know, in vivo. Right. And then there are these off target effects where CRISPR gene editing will not only modify the region you want, it, and there's some technical reasons why it will do this. It'll also modify other regions of the genome that are unintended. Mm -hmm. That these are called off-target effects, and so people are working at minimizing these. But this is where doing the treatment in the lab is really beneficial because mm -hmm. we can then screen cells to make sure that the mm -hmm. ones that we're infusing back into the patient have been successfully gene edited where there's minimal off-target effects, where you're not introducing a new problem, you know, because of the of, of the mm -hmm. off-target effects. You know, and then you Well, know, I'm just sitting there thinking, and it's like I, I agree with what you're saying, but there's always, you know, you're you're not dealing with I'm sampling every cell. You've got uncountable numbers of cells, you know, it's like 10 to the 22, you know, right. Avogadro's type number types of cells. And you just know that down to one part in a billion or something like that, right. you don't have it. So right. it's not that there may be something in there right. that in larger trials will show up or whatever. Right, so. but and you would figure out, you know, what what are the what's the cell count? Yes, yeah. What sample do I take that I can evaluate to make sure that mm -hmm. statistically we know what the percentage is that have been effectively right. changed? <clears throat> right now, now with the. Um, the gene therapy treatment that uh, is the invol involving the life genia technology where you're using the lentivirus, uh, an another technical limitation is, again, you're disrupting regions of the genome. Yeah. It's inherent in the technology. And you also uh, could very very much, if particularly for in vivo work, trigger an immune re reaction. So mm -hmm. you could imagine a scenario like, let's say somebody has... Uh, cystic fibrosis, which is, involves a mutation to a single gene that encodes what's called a chloride transporter, that you could maybe develop some kind of aerosol that would deliver, you know, mm -hmm. the, the gene editing package to, you know, lung cells, 
maybe a certain percentage that even if you could correct that or compensate for it, it would dramatically improve the yeah. the symptoms that the the person with uh, cystic fibrosis is suffering from. The problem is that if you have to do ongoing multiple treatments, you likely are going to generate an immune response right. that eventually will make it impossible to treat the patient. So that's another issue mm-hmm. that has to be addressed. And then, of course, you know, questions of permanency, what are the long-term health effects? Nobody knows. And accessibility is also going to be a big issue as yeah, well. Yeah, that makes sense. Right, because... Um, you know, it's and it, we had a conversation uh, uh, a couple last week, maybe mm-hmm. among scholars, where we were debating this whole issue of the cost of right. this kind of therapy. Where both companies are proposing a cost for the treatment of about two point three million dollars, which is what it would you would expend on a patient who has sickle cell anemia with respect to the course of treatment they would receive over their lifetime. So they're arguing that this is a legitimate price, mm-hmm. but you know, people that are advocacy groups for patients are saying, "Well, this is such a large price tag that most people can't afford it." And because it's still very a very new therapy, insurances may not cover it. Mm-hmm. So this is the, the you know an issue in general with emerging medical treatments, but is going to be an issue that that will probably. Yeah continue to to be debated as new gene therapies uh, come online. Well, and what you do with that is going to have significance. I mean, you know, just even in, in the therapy there, it's like you're wanting to target and do what you want. In some sense, targeting the region you want is the easy part. <laughs> getting it to do what you want without doing something else negative. I mean, that plays out just even in this whole discussion is, yep. you know, if you say, well, we're going to make it so that everybody gets it. Do you remove the incentive that allows the company to say, hey, it's worth right. investing a bunch of money to figure this out? Because a lot of times you just invest a bunch of money and nothing ever comes. You know, it's like there's a lot of pieces that play in there. You know, as complicated yep. as the cell is, the the politics and the economics are pretty complicated as well. So. Right, right. Yeah, so, you know, so these are, you know, there are technical issues and there are ethical issues. Right, right. You know, and, and two additional issues that are, you know, on the table uh, are interrelated, but they involve the potential of using the technology now for enhancement purposes, genetic right. enhancements. I mean, if we can go in and, you know, modify hemipoietic stem cells to treat sickle cell anemia, <clears throat> as an example, could we go in there and modify the hemipoietic stem cells of an athlete to produce a genetically engineered version of hemoglobin mm-hmm. that has superior oxygen binding and oxygen delivering capacity that would make them a high performance athlete, giving them greater durability, mm-hmm. greater endurance, you know, that type of thing. Or, you know, uh, for example, there has there were uh, there was a study done by Chinese scientists looking at using CRISPR gene editing on embryos, on dog embryos, Mm -hmm. but they were able to disable what's called the myostatin gene, which is a gene that controls muscle growth and development. And as a result, these dogs developed with this enhanced musculature. They were very grotesque. (laughs) But you could easily see somebody using that technology to treat a muscle-wasting disease, Mm -hmm. but also at the same time (laughs) using that technology now for enhancement purposes. So, you know, you, you, you by having this, this gene therapy approved clinically, by it becoming more and more commonplace, mm-hmm. you now are make, lowering the, the barrier that leads to resistance to using the gene mm-hmm. therapy for enhancement purposes. You're lowering that barrier. Right. And, well, well, and I see, if, if I could draw a parallel, even just with the AI, I mean, right. it, the the s- more powerful you make the tool, the greater good you can do with it, right. but the greater evil you can do with it as well. <clears throat> that in bo- I mean, there there's two interesting parts. One is th- this strikes me as the same sort of technology. It's technology that can be used for good or could be used for evil. Right. There is an apologetic issue that I've never figured out how to exactly – I can articulate the argument, but I don't know how to make the data for it. Because there's one, there's effectively one human. Humans are there's a, not a large sample size. There's one. 
where my contention is <clears throat> that, you know, when you're talking about AI, you could make an AI or you could make something that is faster or smarter, but when you're talking about humans, we're not just intelligent. We're intelligent, we're relational, we're mobile, we're physical. And my contention is that if you want the human experience, that the human body is optimized for that, that the amount of energy it takes to right. fuel our brain and everything matches, you know, that. so now we want to make us faster. You can make us faster or longer endurance, but it's going to come at a cost somewhere. Right. In some sense, good, bad, or other, this technology would allow us to start measuring that or putting data behind that idea. Right. As opposed to, oh, humans are just, well, it's kind of a huge job. This is as good as it could be. We have no way to test that. Because, but now, it, yeah. Yeah, statistically well, speaking, we could start testing it, whether it's a good idea or not, it's a different question. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, <clears throat> as, as this technology becomes more and more normalized, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's mm -hmm. going to be more and more of a of a temptation to use it for enhancement purposes. And right. CRISPR gene editing is actually fairly easy to use. It's fairly inexpensive as a technology and it's very powerful and it's going to become increasingly versatile. And so it, it almost strikes me as that it's sort of thing cheap enough that if there were a, a reliable way to know what you're doing, you could almost do it at home. I mean, yes. it's, it's that level yes. of cheap. Yes, it is. In fact, it's spawning this thing called a biology DIY movement. <laughs> You know, where there are people that... That's going to go well. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I couldn't say it better, but, <laughs> but you know, the, the, and the, one of the people that's, that, that's spearheading this movement is a guy named Josiah Zayner, who's a biochemist. Okay. And he's like, look, this is such powerful technology that it should be democratized. It shouldn't be in mm. the hands of the medical and the scientific elites. Everybody should have access to it, and mm -hmm. we should be able to use it to do whatever we want. You know, and so, mm -hmm. you know, that is kind of the mindset that's interesting that it, there's that's out there. But there was an interesting survey that I saw uh, in the UK a few years ago now, where they were asking the question: Should we use gene therapy to treat diseases? Okay. And ninety-three percent of the people said yes, of course, right? And you know, I don't know, uh, seven percent said, "Well, we're not not sure." Right? Okay. Nobody said no or at least w within uh, right. any kind of perceptible statistical meaning. But then they asked the question, well, should we use it for enhancement purposes? And of course, what is actually an enhancement and what isn't yeah. is, is a blurry line. Well, you know, 20% of the people said yes. Hmm. 20, and then, you know, and then 60% said no, but another 20% said they hadn't made up their mind. Okay. And so my concern is that, Already, twenty percent of the people aren't really averse to for yeah. hu to human enhancements, and another twenty percent could easily be persuaded. Which means You're there's almost, going to almost be, living in a fifty-fifty world if all that goes right. Yeah. And again, the more people see CRISPR working and treating people, you know, the more they're going to be tempted to mm -hmm. to do the enhancements themselves. So, you know, the point really from an apologetic standpoint is that. This is something that is part of our world, just like AI. Mm -hmm. And as Christians, we can't afford to ignore it. Right. We, we can't afford to dismiss this as being something that's never going to happen. We can't just go out and condemn it. Mm -hmm. We've got to figure out how do we engage it and how do we, as Christians, contribute to the conversation, mm -hmm. right, in a way that helps our world recognize issues like sin or lack of wisdom uh, our capacity to go to do good, um, the desire to mitigate pain and suffering and to promote human mm -hmm. flourishing, the concern about justice and inequitability. Mm -hmm. How do we manage and balance all of this? Right. And I think the Christian worldview has a lot to say and has an ethical framework that uh, really has a motivation for science, for mm -hmm. biomedical advance, for right. AI development. Uh, because it does lead to human flourishing and mitigating pain and suffering. It can create a world where things are more accessible to a, a larger number of people, right? 
but how do we also, you know, prevent this technology from being misused for marginalizing people, right. you know, uh, and ultimately maybe undermining who we are as, as human beings. That's a, a threat yeah. of AI. It's a no, threat it is. with this kind of technology as well. I was reminded, you know, we were at this, uh, you know, we were, you and I were listening to a speaker expound about Job, and one of the comments that stood out, and I think it was Job 28, it's like there's this chapter that kind of doesn't quite fit with the surrounding chapters. But in talking about that, it's like there's this wisdom that's being expounded. And, it said, you know, the comment that stood out to me related to this was, uh, you know, because we're talking about how, well, how do we do this? It's like, you know, do we say no? Well, if you say no, there's good that's not going to be done. But if you say yes, there's bad. You know, it's like, how do you do that? And his comment was, you know, you look through a lot of the Proverbs and there's times where it says, you know, the the wise man doesn't do this or the fool does this. It's like, you know, don't do this. And, and sometimes it's the same thing. And his, the, the comment he made, it was, it's not that there's this rule that you do. It's that the wise man knows yeah. that in this discussion – the question we ought to be asking, are we developing wisdom, not uh, right. the good, bad, or other, the technologies, you know, people are going to pursue the technology, people are going to pursue the intelligence, the, the knowledge to do it, but the wisdom of how do you use it well, how do we develop wisdom in people? Yeah. And that's where I think Christianity really has a good foundation to do that, and I'm not sure a lot of other worldviews can match that. Yeah. Well, and at minimum... Christianity does have a very effective worldview that, mm-hmm. that can contribute to this. But this is also why I think both you and I would, would say the same thing. I would be surprised if you'd say something different, is that this is also why in the church we have to develop a, a very robust understanding of science and technology, mm-hmm. not only so that as you know, members of the church that we are able to engage our culture and even think through how we navigate it ourselves, but we create a robust environment that lets young people know that this is this is actually a mission field. Mm-hmm. This is a calling that if you have a capacity for computer science or you have a capacity yeah. or an interest in medicine or, or biochemistry or molecular biology, you ought to pursue that, mm-hmm. you know, as as a way that in which you serve God and serve human beings. But that you then become that imbe- embedded source of right. Christian wisdom in those communities that are that are developing the technology and making decisions how this technology is going to be deployed. Yeah. yeah and so. if nothing else, as a church, we start thinking. You know, we we are at the forefront of thinking about this instead of reacting once it's become there. Uh, right. Yeah. Honestly, I think that's my perception of the church with cell phones and and I, and I would put myself in this category it's like instead of thinking about hey is this good bad what is it going to do how is this going to form us it was kind of oh the technology's out there let's use it missing the social media part there, there's if i if i had been thinking about that ahead of time i would have approached it very differently mm-hmm. and it's like yeah let's do that as the church because these these are not they're neutral technologies in that they're neither good nor bad they're not neutral in that they have the capacity for great good and great evil, depending on how we use them. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I think that's the real challenge is there is a real promise and a real peril. Yeah. And and the more powerful the technology, the greater the promise and the greater the potential peril. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, but anyway, um, you know, it, it's, I'm like you, I'm, I, when I look at what the, these different pharmaceutical companies have done with the technology, it's very impressive. It is. You know, I'm. I, you know, I stand on in, in awe on the sideline watching how this is developing. But there, there is an unease mm-hmm. that is uh, justifiable. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's pretty fascinating. I, it's, I mean, the the technology is really cool. But uh, yeah, I do think, you know, well, we've we've talked quite a bit about what are the implications and how do we as Christians go. But I mean, there is just a coolness about the technology. I can't get around that. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and, and that you know speaks to the idea that of human exceptionalism yeah, that agreed. we are capable of doing great things because we bear God's image. Yep. And we're capable of doing horrible things because we are sinners. So, anyway, well, on that uplifting note. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Star Cells and God. I would invite you to enter into the discussion in the comments below. 
uh, you know, Jeff and I kind of laid out what are some of the concerns, but we didn't really bring resolution to this in part because these are very complex issues. So we'd love to hear your input, your thoughts on how AI should be used, how gene editing ought to be used. And then also uh, make sure that you like this video, that you uh, share this video with your friends, and that you subscribe at Reasons to Believe to our YouTube channel uh, and use the notification button so that you can be alerted when the next episode of Star Cells and uh, God drops, which is every Wednesday. Also, make sure that you follow us on social media, that you check out our website, Reasons to Believe, and that remember that uh, this is a program that is donor-sponsored. So until next time, remember, the more we have uh, sorry, the more that we know about science, the more that we have reasons to believe. I shouldn't be doing this for a living, I guess. Anyway, God bless you. See you next time. <laughs>